to the 27th inning. I'm your host, Michael Grinnell, and today we will be hearing from former MLB umpire Gary Darling. After making his Major League debut on June 3, 1986, Darling would go on to work 3,270 regular season games over a 26-year career. He worked the 1993 and 2003 All-Star Games and umpired in 85 postseason games, including the 2003 and 2010 World Series, and made 112 ejections over the course of his career. Now, eight years after his last game, Darling spends his time serving as the president of Umps Care Charities, helping to raise money for programs to support children and the families of umpires in need. We'll be back in just a moment, and when we return, you'll hear from former Major League Baseball umpire Gary Darling. We'll get to today's interview with Gary Darling in just a moment, but first I wanted to take a moment to promote Umps Care. He'll talk about it more later on in the interview, but the work being done by this charity is worth giving additional time to promote. Founded in 2006, Umps Care provides a variety of support to children through hospital visits and their scholarship program, as well as supporting families facing financial need within the baseball community. They have a virtual event coming up on Saturday, June 19th called Father's Day Stakes and Stories, where umpires Brian Gorman, Mike DeMiro, and Jerry Crawford, all three of whom are sons of former Major League Baseball umpires, will tell stories and field questions in a Zoom panel that will be moderated by USA Today baseball writer Bob Nightingale. The event is free for monthly donors to Umps Care and $25 per ticket for the general public. Proceeds from this event will support Umps Care programs that include providing programming to underserved youth across the country and in Canada, distributing Build-A-Bears at pediatric hospitals, and changing the lives of children adopted later in life through their college scholarship program. In addition, they work to help meet the short-term financial needs of umpires and their families who are facing difficult challenges. As of Tuesday night, they have raised $340 of their $1,000 goal for the event. For more information on this event or to make a donation, check out their website at umpscare.com. That's U-M-P-S C-A-R-E dot com. And now, here's former umpire Gary Darling. We are here now with former Major League Baseball umpire Gary Darling. Gary, thank you for joining us today. I appreciate you having me on, Michael. Thank you very much. Now, the first question I have for you, and this is one that I've been waiting to ask you ever since I first got in touch with you. Regardless of what sport it is, being an umpire or being a referee is probably one of the most thankless jobs out there. What made you want to become a Major League Baseball umpire? Well, I, growing up, I played baseball through junior college in Sacramento. And uh, one of the classes I took my uh, both years at, at the Kasunas River College, junior college, was sports officiating, just, you know, some extra easier units and kind of liked it, did the different sports. but with baseball always been my, uh, you know, first love of playing growing up. That's uh, it's kind of migrated that way. We got to umpire a few games during the class. And once my playing days were done, uh, I reached out to one of the local associations and started working games around Sacramento. So it wasn't a lifelong plan, but it just kind of migrated that way. Talk about how you got from being an umpire at some of those local games to working your way up to the major leagues. What was that journey like for you? Well, one of the first guys I worked with in Sacramento was a, had been to umpire school. So he gave me the information on it. I rode away to the d two different schools. The, at the time it was Bill Kinneman and Al Summers, which is now Harry Wendelstedt. And uh, Bill Kinneman was bought by Joe Brinkman and Bruce Fremming and, and Jim Evans took over that. Now I think it's just being run by uh, the minor league, you know, the, the minor league development program. But just started working games around Sacramento and the, the assigners were nice. And I got to, you know, work some either one night I might be working a slow pitch softball game. And the next night I was working, you know, an adult men's league where you had guys that had played pro ball and, you know, college ball and stuff. So the, you know, I, I was given a chance to work, you know, some relatively high level games early and just, once I was able to go to umpire school in 1980, I, you know, just took the path like everybody else. You go there and you, you work hard and learn the rules and learn the positioning and hope you do well enough to get recognized uh, 
get invited to the advanced camp in Florida, which uh, used to be at Bradenton where the Pirates train. And, uh, you know, did well there and started um, the journey in uh, 1980 in the Northwest League. So just from the Northwest League to the Cal League to the Texas League to the Pacific Coast League, a little winter ball in Colombia, South America, and Puerto Rico. And got noticed by, uh, I was working with Dana DeMuth when we were in AAA, and he was already working games in the big leagues. And Al Barlick, one of the Hall of Fame National League supervisor at the time was uh, out watching Dane and took a liking to me and just next thing you know get big league spring training and just trying to move up that ladder one rung at a time so it worked it worked out okay. There are very few people you know over the course of the history of Major League Baseball that can say that they were able to step foot onto the field in during a live game how did it feel for you when you're able to take that first step onto the field, your first game as an umpire in Major League Baseball? That was obviously exciting. I got the call. It was 1986. Went from the Pacific Coast League across the country and into Canada and uh, worked the first game in Montreal with uh, crew was Lee Wired, Eddie Montague, and Dutch Renner. So couldn't have broken in with uh, any better of guys. And, yeah, it was just, you know. Each it wasn't like I was ever in panic mode going through the minor leagues. It was just each year I seemed to move up the the ladder a little bit, and just lucky enough to get some games in '86 and '87, and then get hired in '88. So I wouldn't say a lifelong dream, but a an adult an adult dream definitely definitely met for sure. Now talk about what it's like to work in the game like you're having to focus on all these different aspects going on at the same time to try and make the right call talk a little bit about the mindset and what you're thinking and what you're seeing as you're making some of these like close calls during the game I mean it's just you know you got to look at it one pitch one play at a time you can't get ahead of yourself you can't think of the big picture of uh you know, this is, uh, you know, the Cardinals and Cubs and it's August and they're tied for first place and it's a big game. You just got to, every game's the same pretty much. You got to look at it that way so that you know they're not, but every game's the same. Every You got to take it one pitch at a time. The uh, guy that I worked with in, in the minor leagues, Billy, Billy Spooner, is an NBA referee. We went to umpire school together, worked together in the Northwest League and still are close friends. And I tell him the same thing when he's working a NBA playoff game. It's, you know, just one one pitch at a time, one dribble at a time. You can't get ahead of yourself. Just try and get yourself in the position to see the the play and let that whatever that play is, let it finish. I mean, basketball and baseball are a little bit different, but in baseball just just let the catcher catch the pitch before you make up your mind. Let the let the runner run through the bag at first base before you make up your mind whether he's out or safe. You know, now especially with replay, the guy's got a their timing which is the most important thing in umpiring or officiating really is timing, letting the play finish before you make up your mind. Um, you know, especially now their timing has to be impeccable. They have to let the whole play finish because they're always waiting for that microsecond where the guy's hand or foot comes off the base. So just let the whole play finish, then make up your mind and be, you know, decisive about it, not uh, meek about it, but you don't have to jump out of your shoes every time you have a close play either. Just, Yes, you know, it's not an event. We used to say it's not an event. It's either out or he's safe. And, you know, you just take your time and see it and get yourself in the best position. You know, one little uh, equation we used to use when we did some camps back in California, back when we were all younger umpires, you know, positioning plus timing equals good judgment. So if you're in the right position and you have good timing, your chances of getting that particular play are, are really pretty high. So... You, you just said that, you know, as an umpire, you just got to take it like every game is the same, one pitch at a time, one play at a time. But sometimes the games, they do end up being bigger than, some games do end up being bigger than others. You've managed to be on the field to umpire the 2003 World Series, the 2010 World Series. 2003 seemed like a big year for you because you were umpiring in the World Series, the All-Star Game. And you were behind the plate when Roger Clemens reached his 300th win and 4,000th strikeout. Uh, in the game, like you said, you're not really focused on that. It's just every one pitch at a time, one play at a time. But afterwards, are you able to appreciate the impact that you were a part of a moment of baseball history? 
Oh, for sure. You know, yeah, especially now looking back on things like that, definitely. But yeah, in the moment, you can't get caught up because, you know, yeah, sure, Clemens is trying to get his 4,000 strikeout, but Edgar Renteria is trying to get his third hit that night or whatever the case may be. There's always somebody striving for something, whether it's in, you know, late September with the call-ups, you got some, you know, young kid trying to make the club, trying to impress people for next year. You know, he deserves a, a fair shake. You, you know, you just got to – it's either way easier said than done, not getting let the, the moments get to you. But, you know, you just got to – there's times in those big games, the World Series game working the plate, you look around, all of a sudden, holy Christ, the, you know, the stadium is full and it's the seventh inning. And that's the first time you really even notice anything else was going on besides pitches and plays. So it doesn't always happen that you stay focused the whole time and don't hear any of the background or notice any of the background. But in those big, big games – that's generally the case. You just just you just blend in and do your job. Speaking of that, that talk about the background noise and whatnot. Fans, I'm sure sometimes they have very strong opinions about calls that you might have made. Are there any particular heckles or fan interactions that you may remember over the years that stuck out as something uh, particularly memorable? I just, I'm not 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 a particular line or anything, but. Uh, I remember getting booed like three days in a row in Dodger Stadium after having a play at the plate in the first game on <laughs> Friday. And then they introduced us Saturday night. The boos were still pretty loud. They kind of I mean, subsided a little bit by Sunday. But, yeah, I was they were still booing me from Friday night. But, I mean, a lot of times the comments from the crowd is just, you know, background noise. You know, it, it, it's, it's kind of a little, little mumble back there. But try not to hear too many of them. Some, some guys are better – remembering hearing that stuff to me but it's just all just kind of background noise now how about when you have somebody on the field uh disagreeing with your call of players or coaches have you had any uh memorable interactions with players or coaches arguing about a call oh obviously that yeah i mean i remember one funny one with uh rex hudler was playing with the expos now he's i think he's one of the tv guys for the royals he's playing second base and he came charging in I was working the plate, little pop up, you know, behind the mound. Hudler came running and dove for it, hit his glove. He's got the ball in his possession, hits the ground, the ball rolls out. And, you know, umpire world, that's a pretty simple no catch. You got to survive the, the crash on the ground. Hudler looks up and sees that I call no catch, and he, he jumps up and yells, Gary, the ground can't cause a fumble. So. So Rex, we're playing the wrong game here. He, he played a little college football, I guess, at Notre Dame. So getting the rules confused a little bit. But, yeah, I mean, there was, you know, we objected Bobby Cox. I wasn't the only guy ever to do that, obviously. He's he's protecting his players like he usually did. And I was getting ready to, you know, eject Glavin, and Bobby came out and interrupted, and, and interrupted, and we were having a little discussion. He goes, you know, Gary, I really like you, but f*** you, he said. So... A little quick ejection. But, you know, with Bobby, it was always the next day was, you know, he didn't really hold grudges. He might get run the next day, but it really wasn't. He didn't really hold grudges, though. Now, I am curious, uh, from your perspective, is it if there's a set kind of guideline or if it's just, like, up to personal discretion, at what point for you would a player or coach cross the line from, just getting their word in on their thoughts on the call. Uh, what was that line from where they go from talking it out and being upset about it to the point where you're going to eject them? Well, there was a couple of criteria. Well, if they got personal, if they got personal and stopped arguing about the call and, you know, instead of that call was terrible, you're terrible. Once that personal stuff comes in, or that's when the ejection can come. Or if they argue too long or they're arguing too demonstrative or they're, you know, jumping up and down on first base saying that they, you know, they beat the play. Well, that, you know, it's going to get them ejected every time. But if they want to discuss the call for a little bit, that that's always been fine and always will be fine. But when they cross the line and make it personal or get too demonstrative and are showing you up, that's when the ejections can come. Now, when it comes to your guys' work, is there any preparations that you guys are doing off the field or is it just you guys show up uh, on game day, you walk on the field and you get ready to go? 
I mean, if you know, during the regular season, you're generally with the same four guys all year long. That's the theory behind the the crew makeup and the schedules. I mean, with injuries and younger staff they have now, there's guys kind of bouncing around all over the place, guys in concussion protocol and such. But if you know everything's normal, yeah, you, you, everybody knows their job. They, you know, they know that everybody knows the rotations. Everybody knows, you know, where they're supposed to be. So yeah, we don't have quote unquote pre games. I mean, we'll discuss rules. We'll discuss, you know, baseball situations in the locker room, but it's not really going over any particular strategies or anything like that. It's more just heck we get to the ballpark, we get a bite to eat, get into some shorts and go play cards for, you know, half hour, 40 minutes and then get dressed and go on the field. I mean, we would we talk umpiring too, but that was what our way on our crew was to relax by just playing some hearts or spades before the game instead of you know, sitting in your locker, you know, thinking about the game. That just that just makes – gets you more anxious, I think. So we would always just kind of relax by playing cards. But we would talk rules sometimes. If something would come up in another game or something that happened in one of our games recently or, you know, a certain pitcher, you know, likes to not stop sometimes or, you know, we, you, know you just kind of get to know what the players do. But it's not – we don't have, quote, unquote, pre-games like you would in a high school or college game where you're working – that might be the only time you work with an individual. So yeah, it's just more, it's just, you know, the NFL, they work one game a week. The NBA, you know, they work in pods of guys where they, you know, they get together before a game and look at film together and stuff like that. But, you know, we work, you know, 140 games a year during the season and pretty much the whole time is with the same guy. So there's not a whole lot of necessary, not necessity to, you know, go over rotations and, and things like that. So I asked some people online, like what are, what are some questions they'll want to know uh, from an umpire? And one question that I got, uh, somebody wants to know your thoughts uh, or your interactions with Joe West. And he just set the record last night with his 5,376th regular season game umpired. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about Joe West and what he's like? I tell you what, Joe West is day to day, day in, day out, one of the best umpires of all time. I mean, you don't work that many games in the big leagues and not be a great umpire, but you watch Joe West work the bases. He's never out of position. Never. He's always subtle little movements to get in that little keyhole angle to look between the fielder and the runner and still see the base. He was always in position. He wasn't flamboyant, but he wasn't, you know, nonchalant or lazy or whatever. I mean, he was just, if the guy was out, he was out. And nine times out of 10 or 99 out of 100 or more, he was right. I mean, Joe, you know, stickler for the rules and for the way he thinks the game's supposed to be played. Now that's kind of changed over the years with all the unwritten rules and how people, you know, don't respect the, respect authority. Um but, I mean, balls and strikes, one of the best of all time. Great timing, great positioning, uh, great guy to be around, a lot of fun, just uh, an all-around, very generous person. Um, you know, he can, he can laugh at himself. I mean, I remember one time, it's off the field, but Wes and I were working together and we're traveling. I don't even really remember what city it was. But, uh, you know, some some kid came by, he was traveling by himself, and um, – you know, Wesley and I, I always, I'm always messing with people. You know, I can't pass by a little kid without, you know, trying to interact with him. So we're, you know, kind of just messing with this kid. And the kid was kind of, you know, being a little shy and not saying too much. So the cart pulls away and he looks back and he goes, see you later, fatso. <laughs> so Wesley, <laughs> I, I thought Joe laughed so hard at himself. I mean, that I mean, we still laugh about that today. If I just say, see a fatso, he'll know exactly what I'm talking about. So, I mean, he just, he doesn't take himself too seriously, but, you know, he's going to run the game. He's not going to, you know, he doesn't go looking for trouble, but he's not going to shy away from it. And you talk to any of the managers, you know, everybody's been talking about him lately. He's more like one of the guys who like Joey Crawford or Steve Javi in the NBA. Any big game, yeah, a lot of times the players didn't like those guys because they didn't put up with the BS of them, but they wanted those guys on the big games, especially if they're on the road. You know, the NBA kind of thinks that the home team gets an advantage. Baseball doesn't have that so much or that thought so much. But if there's a big game, they, everybody would want Joe West on the game. He's just going to be 
you know, no shenanigans, no BS. He's not afraid to make the the call when it needs to be made. And but, you know, he gets a bad rap from the fans and the media because he always seems to want to put himself in stuff. But that's just that's just Joe. If I mean, if he's got a young guy on his crew and he's in trouble, somebody's arguing with him, he's going to get down there and make sure it doesn't get out of control. People think he's getting there because he just wants to be on TV. No, he's he's helping protect the the young guy on his crew. That's just. I mean, Joe's great with our charity. He's, he spends a lot of time and effort with us. He's, whenever we ask him for something, he's more than willing to help. He always plays in our golf tournament, buys one or two foursomes for people. And he's just a very generous guy and one heck of an umpire. That's really great to hear that because, like you said, there is that kind of perception among some fans and some media sometimes about Joe West. But it really sounds like he is, you know, a really good guy. No, he's a great guy. I mean, I mean, they're having a heck of a party today for him in Chicago after the game with the Oak Ridge boys and everybody playing. But uh, I mean, he's he's given his whole. I mean, guys, he went. To, he's in the big leagues when he was twenty three years old. Hired, I think, when he was twenty five. Before he was twenty five, I mean, a lot of guys. I mean, they're in rookie ball then, A ball then. I mean, I was twenty five. I was in Triple A, and I was moving pretty fast. So, I mean, he's always. He was always at the, he was at the top of his class at umpire school, and he's at the top of the class now. So, doesn't get any better than that. Now, let's talk. Go back to you and your career. Talk about when around the time when you decided that you were going to be retiring. Talk a little bit about that transition from umpiring to life after baseball. Well, mine it wasn't uh, it wasn't anything planned. I wasn't planning on stopping working after the 2013 season. I developed some blood clots in my leg, and it was determined that they were just they it wasn't going to get any better. The clots might go away, but I got a bad vascular system in my in my right leg, so I was going to have to be on blood thinners long time, long term, or for, you know for life. So baseball wasn't going to let me work on blood thinners. So once that determination came around I mean it was one day I, th I was thinking okay I, I might be able to come back this year and then once I would discern I wasn't gonna be able to come back I mean I got my pay was cut off like that day once it was determined mine was a medical issue but not not an injury um I was done so then it was just kind of okay now what's gonna happen I'm you know I was really too young to you know retire I mean I could have retired but the pension wasn't wouldn't have been very good so luckily I you know fortunate the, it was a disabling injury, so I was able to go on long-term disability. But yeah, I wasn't I wasn't ready to get off the field yet. I don't think I'd be working now if, if I hadn't got off, you know, seven, eight years ago. But um, it's just uh, one of those deals, and you move on. It was a little bit of a shock, though, for sure, especially with the paycheck. We'll get into the Ump's Care charity in just one second, but I had one more question I wanted to get your opinion on. Somebody asked me to ask you about this. What are your thoughts on the the idea of the robo-umpire, the automatic uh, balls and strikes being called? Like, what are your thoughts on that idea if that was implemented into the game? I don't think it's good for it. I mean, I don't, I'm not going to say it's never going to happen because that, you know, never is a long time. But I know I know the technology is not there yet. They're still trying to figure out how to call the low pitch with the machine. You know, they keep moving the bottom of the strike zone up to make that curveball that catches the knee on the way by and the catcher catches it down. You know, that now it looks like, you know, the pitch bounces. They're, the machine's trying to figure out how far, you know, how, how they can call that pitch. I mean, the guys are doing such a great job now. I mean, if I mean, I think, I don't know if the average is, you know, 94, 95, 96 percent with the, with as bad as the catching is now. I mean, that's that's pretty phenomenal. I mean, baseball wanted, you know, back in, uh, you know, 98, 99, you know, they, you know, they, um, yeah, the strike zone would get a little too wide. You know, the plate's 17 inches and guys were calling pitches, you know, a couple, three inches, four inches off the plate. And that, you know, that, that does get too wide. And I was probably, I'm, I'm sure I was guilty of calling those pitches too. But that's just the way it was back when we. We came up, you know, you you were taught to call strikes. You wanted to call strikes. The hitter can hit a pitch that's a little bit off the plate. But, you know, sometimes that goes too far. So, you know, they, they decided to start trying to implement this computerized strike zone. So they started, you know, grading the umpires on it. And they've, they've been, that's been a work in progress for, 
20 years now trying to figure it out how, how, how to make that work. So it's not too tight, not too small. Now, you know, people, people like uh, Theo Epstein are kind of realizing now they got to make the strike zone bigger, not smaller. It's already, you know, the, the guys working today. I mean, they just, if the pitch is off the plate for the most part, they ball, it. but that's going to get you in trouble by trying not to call something off the plate a strike. Well, there's going to be, if you do, if you're thinking that way, you're going to ball some decent pitches too. So it's, you know, um, the third baseman for the Astros, Bergman, I guess, was having a discussion with one of the umpires a couple of years ago. You know, a guy called a strike on him that, you know, the machine showed that it was in a half inch outside. And he wasn't bad about it. He didn't argue the pitch. You know, he didn't like it, went and looked. And the next time up, he says, you know, that pitch that you called on me, that strike too, you know, the machine showed it was, you know, like a half inch. And he held up his fingers. It was, you know, this far outside. The umpire looked at him, he said, you go over and ask Verlander, who was on the bench for the Astros at the time, if he thinks that pitch is a strike. I mean, because you're you're stuck between what works for the hitters and what works for the pitchers, trying that find that fine line. Um, I guess to go back and answer your question, I don't think it's it's good for baseball, but I'm not saying it'll never happen because it's just. I mean, the guys are good enough as it is. I mean, what what part of the pitch is determined? You know, when you see the little dot show up on the on the TV screen, what part of the pitch is that? Is that truly in the front of the plate? Or is that some pathway through it? I mean, it's because the pitch is, it's not just one particular part of the pitch that makes it a ball or a strike. It's the whole path of the pitch. So, I don't know, it's coming, but it's, there's, there's still a heck of a lot of kinks to work out. Because, I mean, it's, it's, it changes every hitter. I mean, you got Altuve and Aaron Judge. Those are the two examples that everybody uses. One's six 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 seven, and one's five six five seven. Yeah. And the, but you don't the, the box that they show on TV doesn't change when Altuve's up as compared to Judge's up. It's the same size little rectangle. It's uh, balls and strikes have never been an exact science, and I don't think it ever will be. But you know, they're going to try and use that robo at some time. I don't think it, it, it. You know, just there's too many pitches that all of a sudden it just the cameras don't track the pitch for whatever reason, or you know they lose a signal for a split second and. I mean, there's plenty of pitches when the guys are getting graded. When I, even when I was still working, you know, there'd be a pitch or two that the machine just didn't track, so they wouldn't. It would be a it would be a correct pitch for you. You can't have that in the seventh inning and ninth inning of a game. Also, oh, oh that pitch didn't track on the machine, so uh, let's have a redo. Or now let now I'll try and let the umpire call it. Who hasn't had to call a pitch all night, and also now he's, the machine doesn't work, and now they want you to call it. I mean, it's just. There are a lot of bugs to work out, that's for sure. Yeah, you raised some good points there for sure. Uh, now let's talk about Ump's Care. I had never heard about this charity until I started looking into reaching out to you and doing some research. Talk a little bit about uh, what Ump's Care is and how you got involved with it. Well, it's the official charity of the Major League Umpires. Um, kind of started in its infancy back in 99 it wasn't called ump's care then it was called the helping hand fund is when you know 22 guys myself included lost their jobs in a labor dispute and the guys who were still working you know passed the hat so to speak to try and help the guys who just had their pay cut off so and didn't know when that pay was going to come back if it ever would come back so they would start it that way and then without getting into all the arbitration all that stuff when uh, five of us got our jobs back, then eight of us got our jobs back, and then uh, 11, I think, were the total numbers that got their jobs back. But starting in uh, 2002, we, you know, we're still doing the Helping Hands Fund, and then 2003, said, you know, we got to try and do something more to help help the guys, and um, did a little golf tournament, and, you know, starting to mend some of the ill feelings between the old guys and the, and the new union and all that kind of stuff. So we, you know, just started a little, still kind of on the helping hand fund, but we named it Ump's Care, um, really to help retired umpires at that point that, you know, would fall on far time, hard times with, you know, their pension running out or just not enough and emergencies and stuff. But there was also some other umpires at the time, Field and Culbreth and Mike DeMiro and Tim Timmons. They were doing Marvin Hudson. They were, they were doing the a blue crew where they would they'd have, you know, an occasional kid out to the ballpark or, do a hospital visit. So we decided, okay, we got Ump's Care doing, you know, trying to help retired members. We got these guys doing stuff. 
helping different communities around the country. Let's kind of just merge the two. And that's what happened in 2006. That's when Ums Care really started to take root and move forward. Um, start out, you know, we do, we've had uh, last year, virtually we had 700 Build-A-Bears for kids in hospitals. Over the inception since 06, we've had almost 18,000 that we've given up. We do, we go and do 10, 12 hospital visits a year, still kind of virtually now where we'll still send the Build-A-Bears, but try and interact via Zoom or, you know, social media that way. Um, we, we, we're we having kids out to the ballpark with different programs, you know, um, BAT and not, not BAT, but uh, KC Cares and Boys and Girls Club and stuff like that. The kids would come out with their mentors and we'd get them down to the umpire room and show them, put on, let them put on our gear, take them out on the field, let them sit in the dugout, maybe meet a player or two. Um, and then our, and then we expanded even further. Now we do our hospital, I mean, our uh, scholarship program where each year we award a $10,000 scholarship to a child that was adopted later in life. Um, and we, we give them 10,000 all four years of school if they still maintain, you know, a, a certain GPA and are staying in school and doing all the things they're supposed to. But we, it ends up being a $40,000 scholarship for a kid, which is, that's pretty substantial. We've had Absolutely. five, we've had five graduates so far. We have three at different stages of college now, and we're in the process of analyzing the, the 29 applicants we got for our scholarship this year. So it went from a charity just trying to help our own to, you know, helping, you know, disadvantaged and uh, physically and, you know, disabled and sick, you know, kids and, and their families. So it's, it's come a long ways. We're all very proud of it. That's for sure. Do you guys have any events coming up or is there any way that people could help out with the charity? Um, we, there's always, we always have the hospital visits. Um, uh, we have a uh, Father's Day, uh, we call them Stakes and Stories. Right around Father's Day this year, we're having uh, Bob Nightingale from USA Today is going to moderate it. He's going to have on uh, Jerry Crawford, because in, in line with Father's Day, Jerry's brother and his father was a National League umpire. His brother, Joey, was an NBA official. We have Brian Gorman, whose dad played and umpired in the big leagues. He's going to be on, and Mike DeMiro, whose dad was an American League umpire. So we have those throughout the year. Um, we're always, you know, the, the, we have people that sign up and, you know, make monthly donations just to support the charity. Uh, we'll have a golf tournament next January, we hope, in Arizona. We do stuff during spring training. We have, you know, 100 hole events where, you know, we'll go out and play 100 holes in one day, and people will sponsor that. We have you know, there's we have an online auction I think it's going to be more in August I think this year we moved that back a little bit um, that's hosted by MLB but yeah if people go to umscare.com there's you know just numerous ways you can uh, support support our charity Gary darling thank you for speaking with us today my pleasure Michael you have a great day and uh, good luck to you with your future podcasts and that will do it for this episode of the 27th inning. Thanks again to Gary for being on the show. Don't forget to check out umpscare.com to learn more about their virtual Father's Day event or to make a donation. Make sure to subscribe for future episodes. And you can find the show now on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever else you listen to your podcasts. If you have suggestions for future guests you'd like to hear from or questions that you'd like them to answer, drop a comment on our new Facebook page at the 27th inning. And also make sure to like it to get updates on the show and upcoming guests. Check back for next week's episode where you'll hear from author Tommy John III and his father, longtime Major League pitcher Tommy John. Thanks for listening. Have a great day.